Uh, the book of Acts, our first text, Acts chapter 1 specifically, will be our first text. We're going to talk this morning about prayer in the life of Lake Merced. Prayer in the life of Lake Merced. Uh, we're reflecting uh, this summer, at least in my teaching, upon things that affect our, our church life. Go ahead, Nathaniel, and you can go ahead and bring that up. We're looking at things that affect us as we consider uh, our place here at Lake Merced. We've experienced a lot of turnover, but we've always experienced, at least since I've been here, a lot of turnover. If you talk to Eileen, as you talk to Janet, people who have been here a long time, people have come and go. They've come and gone. At different times, the church has gone through a lot of very painful, difficult times. It's gone through uh, good times, uh, which is typical of a lot of churches. But there are not too many churches that are as uniquely placed for opportunities for good than the church here at Lake Merced. We've talked in weeks past about our location here on Brotherhood Way, our building facility size, our parking. Many churches would love to have these things. And to be in the city of San Francisco, where the gospel is greatly needed, as it is everywhere, but especially here. So for us to be an outpost of faith, of devotion to God, of a desire to practice New Testament Christianity, uh, to be an authentic group of people that people can come meet with and they can trust and they can be comfortable around, that is a great blessing. Again, we have many things that other churches would love to have. So... Say that again? We have, it all. we have it all, and we just have to build upon having it all. And instead of looking at, oh boy, we wish these seats were filled, and we do, we have to see what we already have. And that's exactly again what Paul, I'm sorry, not Paul, but the angel of the Lord, as he spoke from Jesus to the church in Philadelphia, you have but a little strength, but behold, before you is an open door. So we want to make sure that we open all the doors that God has made open to us even though we're a small church. And this morning we're going to talk about the open door that's always open, that is prayer, and especially how important prayer is to a smaller church. We're going to look to understand the importance and influence of praying as a church. I want you to think just for a moment just to what we're doing when we pray. We are doing something that God has called upon us to do, the creator of this world has called upon us to talk to him. He doesn't make us make an appointment. He doesn't make us talk for only a certain amount of time and then he needs to go on to somebody else. He never tells us that this concern is too small or you've asked me about this too many times. With God, uh, as the song Nathaniel led represents, a sweet hour of prayer and but Jesus at times spent all night in prayer. But then we find at times prayers can be very short. In fact, most of the recorded prayers, especially in the New Testament, are very short. Prayer is something that's very flexible regarding what we do. <clears throat> but it's very powerful concerning what we're doing. The God, the creator of this world, the one who sustains this world by his mighty hand, the one who knows every one of our weaknesses, every one of our struggles, the one who can see into the future, the one who knows our past but doesn't hold it against us, the most important person in our life seeks to listen to us. And we know that very well personally. A lot of times we don't apply it as much to our life as the church as far as praying together even though as the church, when we're home alone praying, we're praying as the church. But we tend to think of those prayers as more personal. But there's also time we spend praying together as a church. And this is one area we can always work on. And even though we're a smaller church, this is one area that well, we can really thrive. We may not have a big program or a project like a lot of big churches might have or numerous classes, but we can pray. And we can pray as powerfully as any church that has hundreds or thousands of members. So this morning we're going to make five observations about prayer. You'll see those already in your notes. We'll just go through them fairly quickly to kind of see them. A lot of them are things we're familiar with, but we need to underline them or underscore them. 
And then we'll talk just briefly about 10 ways we can improve our praying right now. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at five observations about church prayer. First of all, it's essential. Church prayer is essential to church life. It's our lifeline. It's our means of communication to God that shows our dependence upon Him. Not only for our existence, but our dependence upon Him for growth and our future. I want to see how this was brought out in the life of the early church. First of all, Acts chapter 1, verses 12 and 14. Look at the scene right before the church started. Again, the book of Acts records the beginning of Christianity. It's when the first church started and in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus has already ascended into heaven after spending about 40 days on the earth after his crucifixion. He told his apostles to go into Jerusalem and wait till he would send the Holy Spirit to them. So they've gone into Jerusalem to wait along with other believers. But notice what they do as a church. <clears throat> Verse 12. It says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem, that's just as Jesus said, from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. Who are all these individuals? These are the apostles. These are the hand-picked followers of Jesus there with him. Judas here is not the Judas that already killed himself, but one by another name. But look what they were doing. <clears throat> look what they were doing, verse 14. They were all joined together constantly in what? In prayer. Along with the women... And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So here you have the group of apostles going right to where Jesus told them to, meeting up with other believers, which included the mother of Jesus, <coughs> women who played a prominent part in the early beginnings of the church and showed great faith in Jesus when others didn't, and with Jesus' brothers who have now been converted. But look what they were doing. They weren't coming up with a big budget. <laughs> uh, they weren't trying to run the numbers, look at the data, and to see what kind of the conversion projects they need to engage in. They weren't interested in building a big building. Uh, they weren't doing anything like that. It says they were constantly in prayer. They recognized the most important thing to their church life at this point was being together, and the activity was praying together. It was essential before they even became the churches. They're waiting for the Lord to send a spirit. They're going to wait together in prayer. So they considered it to be essential. Look at chapter 2 now, verse 42. Next chapter, chapter 2, verse 42. <clears throat> in chapter 2, we find 3,000 people baptized into Jesus Christ. Peter preached the first sermon. People were convicted in heart. They asked, what can we do to be saved? And Peter told him, repent, be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the church begins, but notice what they do even after beginning. <clears throat> Verse 42. They devoted themselves, <clears throat> they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, <clears throat> the breaking of bread, and to what? Prayer. Let's just stop there looking at that one verse. It says, first of all, they devoted themselves to these things. It doesn't say they thought it was a good idea that, hey, maybe someone should pray. <laughs> uh, they didn't look at it like that. They devoted themselves. They already were devoting themselves to prayer before they began as a church. We saw that in chapter 1. Now they're continuing that under this powerful sense of devotion. 
It says they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. We looked at that two weeks ago. So the apostles were teaching them as Jesus said they would, as they received teaching also from the Holy Spirit about what to do. So prayer must have been an instruction from God. They were breaking bread, and here that metaphor is most likely for the Lord's Supper. But prayer is right there. <clears throat> Yet they don't have a church building. They don't have elders. They don't have a budget. Uh, to my number, they haven't even, or to my knowledge, they haven't even taken a contribution yet. But the one thing they can do is they can pray. And we're going to talk about the freedom we have simply to pray, even when we have nothing else. But right now, just notice that they believed it to be essential. Fast forward now to the 12th chapter of Acts. Um, the significance of going forward to chapter 12 is that persecution of the church has now started. It started in chapter 8. It intensifies in chapter 12 where Herod, the king or the governor of that area, will reach out and kill one of the apostles. That is the apostle James. But I want to see what the church did in relation to prayer, even under persecution. Verse 1 beginning. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. <clears throat> this happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial <coughs> Excuse me. after the Passover. Notice verse 5 now. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Stop here. Notice that James has already been killed. Herod notices, hey, he got a lot of attention from the Jewish people that hated these early Christians, so he, he goes ahead and imprisons the apostle Peter. And he, he's looking to bring him to trial, verse 4, after the Passover. Verse 5, Peter's kept in prison. But what is the church doing? Are they protesting? Are they leading a political protest saying, hey, you can't, you can't imprison us as Christians, we have rights. Are they doing that? Uh, are they abandoning assembling altogether? <clears throat> no, we don't find any record of that. But we do find Luke recording they continu they're continuing in doing what? Praying. It says the church was earnestly praying to God for them. We'll revisit this text later on in the lesson. But just notice the sense of prayer being essential to the early church. Before they became a church, they're gathered together at the house of Mary, praying. After they become the church, they're devoting themselves constantly to prayer. Even under persecution, when you think, well, maybe they could just spread out and hide, they're still gathering together praying. So the early church, under the apostles' teaching and under Jesus' headship, understood that prayer is essential to the life of the church. And this is what we, as Christians here at Lake Merced, have to always maintain that prayer should be center to our life. Not only is it something we can easily do, if you will, but it's at the center of our life. So in weeks to come, we need to look at how can we perhaps expand our life of prayer in the church here. I think that's probably one area we could work on more. I think we've probably reduced our time praying together over the last few years than we have increasing it. So this is probably one area where we could, we could work on it a little bit. As I thought about the things I focused on in previous lessons, I thought, well, prayer is probably something we can work on some more, at least in our public prayer. Notice also that prayer was requested. It wasn't just always assumed by the apostles that Christians would be praying. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Just because the apostles taught in general Christians are to pray, doesn't mean they never said anything about it at any other time. 
We looked at this a couple weeks ago. Let's just revisit it. The very last chapter of the letter to the Ephesian Christians, look how much prayer is emphasized, and specifically, look who is asking for it and how intense his asking is. And this is the Apostle Paul who wrote Ephesians. He wrote 13 of the New Testament letters. Perhaps the most powerful New Testament figure outside of Jesus Christ himself. Undaunted, unstoppable, going from one city to another, experiencing persecution, uh, isolation at times. But he continues on this mission. But notice what he still wants. Because he's not just operating on his own strength. Verse 18. Paul says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and request. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Verse 19, pray also for me that whenever I speak words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, For which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. Notice his emphasis upon prayer. He says, first of all, you pray on all occasions. All kinds of prayers and requests. And this is consistent with what we saw in Acts. The church was constantly devoted to prayer. He says, pray on all occasions. All kinds of prayers, requests. Uh, be alert. Keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So he wanted prayers to be prayed for other people that were in situations of need. He says, do that first, verse 18. But then what does he want for himself? More food? More clothing? Uh, does he pray for freedom? Hey, could someone pray me out of this prison? Could someone pray for me a new set of clothes? Because I'm going on to Corinth next week, and I need a new set. He says pray that he might what? Even though he's imprisoned, he says he's an ambassador in chains, he's simply praying for what? Give me words and strength behind those words that I might declare it boldly or fearlessly. He recognized that the key to his strength was not listening to like a a set of cassette tapes on how to be bold, how to say things strongly at the right time, uh, how to emphasize. He simply says, pray that I might be bold about what I know is true. Just like in our culture in these times and in this area, it's not easy to talk about the things of Christianity in a comfortable way because we don't know how people are hearing them. And we're not in the majority in this area. And Paul was in the same circumstance. So we request that prayers be made for him. So if he needs prayer, and he knows people need prayer in the first century, how much more should we in this time and in this place since our need of prayer and pray for the same things? Look at another text where the same thought is brought out. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And a lot of times we'll look at two texts simply to show that there's a pattern for something which shows how, an impo- how important it is. Here Paul is speaking to an entirely different church, the church in Thessalonica. You can visit that place today. You can see the grounds, not the actual church building. They didn't have one, but you can visit. It's called Thessaloniki, if you see it on the map, but it's ancient Thessalonica. Notice how Paul ends this letter. It's very similar to the ending of Ephesians. Verse 16, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says in verse 16, rejoice always. Then he says, verse 17, what? Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Verse 19, do not treat prophecies with contempt. But test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject what is harmful. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body 
be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. and He will do it. Then verse 25. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Then he says, greet all God's people with a holy kiss. Thank you, Nathaniel, for bringing the text. I love that. Uh, twice he says, pray. Verse 17, pray continually. And then he says, pray for us again. Paul never stopped recognizing his need for prayer, and he never stopped recognizing the need for the brothers and sisters to be praying all the time, or continually, or consistently. Prayer is a lifeline. So prayer is essential. We find it in the New Testament always requested, so that just underscores how much it's needed. Also, it's very doable. Look at Acts chapter 4. Go backwards now, back to the book of Acts. This is a powerful scene of prayer. And I just want to reflect upon how doable prayer is for us and explain what I mean by doable. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Here in the early stages of persecution, it intensified in chapter 8 and 12, but the threat started in chapter 4. The Jewish leadership did not like the apostles especially Peter and John, going around talking about this resurrected Jesus who they thought they'd gotten rid of. So they kind of captured Peter and John, threatened them, saying, hey, you keep on doing this, trouble's going to come. But notice what happens with Peter and John after they were threatened. Verse 23. It says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. That's the church. <coughs> and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they said, we got to run. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that at all, does it, Mary Gail? No, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in what, Mary Gail? In prayer. Every time the church is threatened or good things come their way, they're devoting themselves to prayer. Let's keep reading. Verse, uh, here's the prayer. <clears throat> Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Verse 27, the prayer continues. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power had decided beforehand should happen. Now verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with what? Great boldness. <clears throat> Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your Holy, Spirit, uh, Holy Servant, Jesus. Verse 31 now. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Let's talk about prayer being doable. Peter and John, they come back and said, hey, the elders, of the Jewish people, the chief priests said, we better not be preaching Jesus anymore. Their first response is not to draw up some plans about how they need to all scatter and hide and wait until it's more comfortable, or not how they can change the message so it's more palatable, so it's not so upsetting to people. They just pray for what? More boldness. And isn't that our challenge too? We know what Scripture says about Jesus. We know what the Bible says about morality. We know what the Bible says about the future and Jesus' return. Our challenge is to talk about those things with friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, with confidence. Because we know this message that we hold dear to us is not commonly accepted in our culture at all, especially in this area. So the temptation is, and it's for me at school where I teach, is to just be quiet, <laughs> to be a nice person, to be the nice teacher. 
and be content with that, where really I need to try to be engaging more of my fellow teachers as I'm able in the right circumstances. <clears throat> I need to be more bold. And this was the same challenge of these early Christians. They've just been threatened. They say they go right to the Lord in prayer. And they pray for boldness. But notice here they did not need a seminar on how to pray. They did not need 12 classes to figure out how to ask for boldness. They did not attend a conference somewhere. They were not told to read like three sets of books, book one, book two, book three, and then begin praying, now that they know how to do it right. The first thing they did when Peter and John got back, it says when they heard this, when they heard about the threats, they immediately what? They raised their voices together in prayer. And to my knowledge, they had no formal training on how to pray other than what had already been taught to the apostles. Prayer does not require a speech class. It doesn't require some organizational guide. Here's what you pray for first, second, or say it this way or say it that way. Prayer is your natural thoughts combined with what you know God has required in Scripture being expressed to God. And that's what they're doing here. It looks like this prayer was not planned. It was simply something where they said, Lord, listen to us. Consider their threats, verse 29, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They just let those words fly. Prayer is the most doable thing we can do. Because what God is looking for is authentic words from His believers. We might stumble at times. We might run out of words. We may not know what to say. But remember what Paul says in Romans 8 about the Holy Spirit lives within us and sometimes helps us with our prayers because we don't always know what we ought to say. So the Holy Spirit is right there with them. It says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the Word of God boldly. Don't ever minimize your prayers. Don't ever think that, boy, that prayer was too short. Or I don't know if I said the right thing. Or I don't know if that's going to help anybody what I just prayed for. Or when I prayed publicly, I felt like I stumbled over something or I didn't get my words out. All of us would love to speak and capture things a different way at times. But prayer is doable because it requires nothing other than your devoted heart and those heart-expressing words to God. So you can always do it. At home, in the assembly, it's very doable. It's effective. This same text, we won't turn to another one for this point. Did you see what happened in verse 31 after they prayed this powerful prayer? It says, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was what? <clears throat> Shake, and they had a 5.8. <laughs> I think that's a safe number, right? Shake you a lot, but no, no building collapsed. <clears throat> They had an earthquake, but it was not some accidental earthquake. It wasn't just the tectonic plates moving as they periodically do where we live. This was clearly the Spirit of God sending a message to His people. What do you think that message was? I am with you. And all of a sudden it says, and they spoke, spoke the Word of God boldly. Our prayers get the attention of God. And as this early church is struggling with a persecution they've never experienced, and they're recognizing it's going to become a very hostile place to be a believer there in Jerusalem. God's wanting them to know as they reach out in prayer to Him that I'm going to be with you. And He actually lets that be known by shaking the building that they were in. Our prayers get the attention of God. Now we may not always have the room where we prayed shaken. And we shouldn't expect an auditorium shaking every Sunday. That's not what the Scripture's saying. But what it is saying is that your prayers are effective. And James, he writes, the prayers of a righteous person affect much or, or effectual. There's an extended text on prayers not only arrive at the ears of God, God is always looking to act upon the prayers of His people. That doesn't always mean He does exactly what they ask for. 
because he sees things differently. He can see farther down the road or he knows what's best. But they're effective because they get the attention of God. And when God is working on your life, whether it be personal things in your life that you're struggling with, whether it be a marriage or a conflict with someone or a, a work situation, when you're praying about that to God, it's getting His attention. You're calling upon the person that cares the most about your problem and that can do the most about your problem. And that will work on it in his time and on his timetable. Prayer is always effective if your life is being lived for God. Another observation, then we'll hit 10 quick points about improving our prayer. Look at Acts 12 again. <clears throat> prayer has examples. Prayer has examples. I said we'd return to this text um, earlier in the lesson, but this is the one, the text where James had already been killed by Herod. First apostolic martyr. The apostle James killed. Herod says, hey, that got me a lot of attention. I'm going to take Peter now and put him in prison and put him on trial, and presumably he's going to kill Peter too. <clears throat> but notice what the church does. Let's start again, verse 1, and let's go right through verse 17 and look at how God responded to the prayers of the church about Peter. This is a very candid camera picture of the church praying. How many of you remember that old show, Candid Camera? It's probably one of those beginning reality shows where they would have a camera on. You guys all remember that? Uh, yeah, where they'd have a camera some might be too young, I don't know. But uh, uh, they, they would put a camera, a hidden camera, to just see how people would act when they didn't know they were on camera. And I, Alan Funt, I believe, was the, the host of that show. And it just saw people in humorous situations. This is humorous, as well as powerful. Let's begin reading Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Verse 3, when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Let's pause here. So he's in prison. The church is earnestly praying to God. What do you think is the number one thing they're praying for, for Peter? They hope he gets out. <laughs> yes, they know what happened to James. He did not get out. He was killed. And now the most prominent apostle, Peter, looks like he's about to meet the same fate. So if we were gathered together and Peter was in prison, that would be the number one. I'd ask, Jay, could you pray that Peter might get out? And I'd then ask someone else, hey, could you pray that he might be given boldness? Barbara, could you pray for that? Things like that. But getting out is number one. Let's read on. <clears throat> Verse 6, that night, or the night before Herod was to bring him to trial... Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and the light shone in the cell. <clears throat> he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Verse 8. And the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Verse 9. Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. <coughs> Verse 10. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. 
When they walked the length of the one street, suddenly the angel left him. Okay, let's pause here. So here an angel has been sent by God, frees him of the chains in prison, leading him out. They go right through the gate. This is exactly what the church had been praying for, that Peter might get out. The Lord's directly responding by sending an angel to do that. Verse 11 now, this is where the humor begins. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were what? Praying. Okay. Peter knocked at the outer entrance. And a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. So he's there knocking. She sees it's him. She just runs to the, back to the church who's gathered praying. Notice how they react to her. Verse 15. What do they say to this dear woman who sees Peter? You're out of your mind? They told her. What's humorous about that? They're gathered together praying for what? Him to be released. Someone comes and tells them he's right here. They tell this woman, you're out of your mind. They don't even believe that their prayers would be answered. At least not like this. That's somewhat humorous. We'll talk about that in just a minute. <clears throat> when she kept on insisting it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. <clears throat> this is the candid camera picture of the church. The church is praying in chapter 5. From the moment he was taken, they're still praying while he was imprisoned. The Lord answers the prayer directly through an angel that just gives them a personal escort right out of prison, right to the front door of the church building. Someone goes and says, hey, it's Peter. And they tell her, hey, you're crazy. That's our challenge with prayer. Really believing God's going to do the very thing we ask for. And we're simply called upon to pray. But James says the prayer of the righteous, or the prayer prayed in faith, avails much. We may not always receive by God's providence what we're asking for. That's another point. But we at least need to believe that God can and will, in His providence, fulfill our prayers. And not be caught here having the prayer answered, and us not even know it. So these examples are powerful. Let's talk about ten ways to improve our praying right now. Real quick, and then we're done. I'll just read these and let you <clears throat> kind of work them out. First of all, we want to improve our praying as a church. Do this. Get in the habit of praying for necessities, blessings, strengthen for others. The best way to strengthen our corporate prayer life is strengthen our personal prayer life. Make sure you're giving thanks for your food. Giving thanks for clean water, electricity, all those things. All the blessings in your life. Make sure you're always praying personally for those things. Never be neglecting prayer. And always be praying for others. Our church life of prayer will be strong if people's individual lives of prayer are strong. Number two, find a regular time for personal prayer. The hardest time for me to pray recently has been this summer when I'm out of school. Because <clears throat> when I'm in school, I get up real early in the morning because I have a very regimented life during the week. But when you're on summer vacation, you're traveling, everything's different, that's when it's hardest to pray because that regularity is not there anymore. And I've struggled a lot to find regular times to pray. And I've had to kind of just pray when I knew I could because I'm not getting up at the same time anymore, things like that. But 
try to find a regular time you know you can consistently pray. Three, pray with your loved ones. <clears throat> it always helps to pray with others. If you have kids, pray with them. Pray with uh, spouses that will pray with you or at least listen to you pray. Friends, <clears throat> people that share a faith in God, pray with people. That will always strengthen prayer life. Number four, focus during times of group prayer. It is easy to allow our minds to wander when someone's praying. It's easy to think about our day and what we're going to do. It takes work at times, even with our public prayers here, to, to really listen to what someone is praying for. We have to always work on that. So focus during times of group prayer, and that will improve our praying. <clears throat> if you're leading prayer, prepare for those prayers. Sometimes it's best to just pray from the heart if the words naturally flow. But other times if you recognize, well, maybe my words don't always flow at all. There's nothing wrong with writing down a prayer and thinking about who you'd like to include. These are five practices we can do personally to strengthen our praying. Here's five that will really help Lake Merced. <clears throat> Pray for opportunities for us. Pray for more visitors to find their way to us. Pray for seekers that are seeking the Lord to find their way to Lake Merced. That's one thing you can pray for that will be good for the church. Pray for guidance for Lake Merced. Pray for those who teach, myself and Jay and Michael when he comes, and any guest speaker, that they'll choose words the church needs to hear. That's something you can do. Pray to the Lord that we might be blessed with his guidance. <clears throat> pray for perseverance for the Lake Merced church. Our job is to hang in there. And to not quit as a church. Though we might see people coming and going, it always hurts when people go and move on to other places. We're obviously going to hurt when you leave. And Satan wants that to discourage us. And make us think, well, maybe we need to think about wrapping things up here. Or maybe we need to... Things like that. We can't have that mindset. We need to keep going to God in prayer that we might not give up and persevere that, and believe that there's an open door here in Lake Merced that we need to open <coughs> further. <coughs> Pray for the growth of Lake Merced. Not only numerical growth, but personal growth. We do want to grow in number. We want this building filled because that's a good thing. 3,000 people were baptized on the first day of the gospel being preached, Acts chapter 2. So we want a full building. We want a building full of people in a big building. But also pray that every brother and sister here might be strengthened in their faith, going through difficult times, hardship. They might get through taxing family circumstances they might be dealing with or financial hardships that no one knows about. Pray that people here might get through times of loneliness or despair or frustration. Even if you don't know about everyone's personal circumstance here, you can still pray in general for people's well-being. And you're praying as the church. And you're praying for our strength. And then finally, pray to God, or pray for God to be glorified, I should say, through Lake Merced. We don't exist here just for ourselves. But we're here for the praise and the glory of God, being the people that He sent His Son to die for. And as we improve our prayer lives, as we become more devoted to prayer and more in tune to what God wants for us, that will bring God glory. We'll be strengthened, absolutely. But it brings glory to God because we're being the kind of people that He always envisioned when He sacrificed His Son that we were, might be, be brought from darkness to light. And may he always find glory in this church, no matter how big it is or how small it is. He can be glorified in this place. And may we be the ones that bring him glory. <clears throat>
Just a moment after we sing Nathaniel's song, one, one way of improving our prayer life, I'd like to get back to what we used to do is have a closing prayer. So they're saying, hey, ever have a great week, which is good. But getting back to having a closing prayer. And that, I think, is one way we can improve our prayer life as a church. So we'll do that in just a moment. But hopefully this has been helpful to you. Everyone has a part in improving the life of prayer in this church. You may not lead prayer in the assembly, but when you are praying together with people, <clears throat> or you're praying strongly at home for this church, you are praying as the church. And God will find different ways to strengthen us through prayer.